Hello everyone, I'm Zhu Chen Zhao from Tianjin University. Uh, welcome to our series of virtual academic seminars to celebrate the launch of SmartMed. Uh, SmartMed is co-launched by Wayne and Tianjin University. I'm one of the social editors of SmartMed. Uh, the editors in chief of SmartMed are Professor Wen Ping Fu from Tianjin University and Professor Hua Zhang uh, from City University of Hong Kong. Now, SmartMed has been indexed by ESCI with the first impact factor of 20.4. Uh, SmartMed has also been selected as Zone 1 in Chinese Academy of Sciences division. Uh, welcome to submit your work to SmartMed. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Lam uh, from DGIST uh, will give the presentation. Now, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Lam first. Uh, Dr. Lam uh, received his bachelor and uh, PhD degree uh, from the Department of Materials, uh, Science and Engineering, uh, so uh, National University, Republic of, of Korea. After he received a PhD degree, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Toronto, Canada, uh, from September uh, 2017 to January 2020. Uh, since February 2020, he has been working as a system professor in the Department of Energy Science and Engineering, uh, DGIST, Republic of Korea. Uh, his research focuses on the development of heterogeneous uh, catalysts for the chemical CO2 reduction uh, toward value added chemicals. Today, Dr. Lam will give a talk about the chemical carbon dioxide reduction catalysts for multi-carbon chemicals reproduction. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Lam, please. Thank you. Okay, now I will stop sharing. Now, please, Dr. Oh, Lam. Okay. Uh, now, can you, please, can you see yeah, my you screen? Can I can see now. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, okay, everyone. Uh, so we'll feel free to start now. Now it's okay. Oh yeah, okay, I see. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Taehyun Nam, and uh, as the uh, Professor Ji Cheng uh, Zhang introduced, uh, currently I'm working at the DGIS in the some South Korea. So before I start my talk, and I would like to express uh, my sincere thanks uh, to the some smart men. Uh, for inviting me to this wonderful seminar. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, electrocatalysts uh, which can be uh, used for the, some CO2 conversion to the other value added chemicals. Uh, today, especially, uh, we are going to talk about the CO2 reduction catalysts uh, which can produce the multi-carbon chemicals, especially. So as you can see uh, in this slide, so there is an urgent need to solve this global warming issue uh, with the rapid growth of the industry. So if you look at, uh, as you look at in the some left-hand side of uh, figures, it, it shows some uh, global temperature change uh, according to the uh, time. And as you can see, though some temperature uh, is, keep, uh, is uh, increasing and uh, Accordingly, uh, the, when you uh, measure the, some atmospheric the CO2 concentration, uh, it also increases uh, uh, since uh, some 1958 to this uh, 2017. So it means that some this CO2 can be the major reason for uh, inducing this, this kind of some global warming. So to solve this uh, uh, global warming issue, some, there is an urgent need for the, some the, uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, which combines the, some CCU, some carbon capture and the utilization. So these days, uh, some uh, people are very interested in about the, how we can capture the, some CO2 from the air or the, some uh, fluid gas uh, by using this kind of some uh, uh, facilities. So today, the, I explain about some CO2 reduction, and it is related with the, some uh, carbon utilization. It means that so we need to convert CO2 into the other value-added chemicals, such as the feedstocks and the some of the fuels. So I'm going to talk about this utilization part. So this page shows some uh, pictogram and some uh, flow chart 
uh, starting from this renewable energy uh, for to the um, CO2 electrolysis, which you are interested in. So uh, if we uh, look at this the, uh, icon, then it represents some like uh, uh, we can uh, get uh, some renewable electricity, but from the, some solar cell and some other some renewable energy sources. So these are these electrolyzer is uh, some what we are interested in for the, some CO2 conversion. And if you look at this one, they have the, some similar some icons. It means that the, some there are some electrolyzer systems and the, some structures are sim similar things. So if we want to run the, some like a uh, uh, water electrolysis, we need uh, some water and uh, we need the uh, electricity to uh, for the, some water splitting. And in the some uh, by reducing the water, then uh, we can get uh, some hydrogen, and this can be the source for the some to operate the, some fuel cell or the, some these can also the electricity can be stored in the, some battery. And the CO2 electrolysis, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, is a little bit different uh, in the in the way of the converting the energy, but the structures of the electrolyzer is similar with this one. So to run the CO2 electrolysis, uh, we need to have the, some electro electricity and also we need uh, uh, water for the, some uh, electrolyte. And uh, we need one more some input that is a uh, CO2. So uh, if we uh, apply the CO2 and the, some water, and the, so if we apply the, some electricity, then some uh, ideally we can get uh, some like uh, various kind of some chemicals which can be used directly to our some living life. So these are the categorized by the some like uh, feedstocks, or they can be also categorized into the some fuels. So uh, in order to uh, control the selectivity of this uh, product, then so we need to develop the, some catalysts. So we are going to talk about this catalyst part more in detail in the some next page. So uh, as you can see the some left hand side figure, these diagrams show the some uh, the what kind of chemicals which we, uh, we can produce by the CO2 reduction. So if you look at this uh, yellow shaded area, they represent the some C1 products. It means that the some the uh, one uh, carbon atoms are included in the some molecule. The examples would be the some carbon monoxide, formic acid, methanol, or the some methane. And if we look at the some bottom part, then some eye shaded it does some like a green color one. Uh, as you can see, the major difference between the C1 and the C2 product is uh, some number of carbons in one molecule. So in the case of C2 chemicals, and you know, we can see that there are some two carbon atoms are uh, located uh, in the some one molecule, and the representative products are the some ethylene, ethanol, and the some acetate also can be the product. Uh, the reason why we need to uh, develop catalysts is that, uh, because these chemicals are formed simultaneously because of their some overlapped uh, thermodynamic or potential range. So to control their selectivity, as you can see, some most people, uh, most researchers are also very doing hard work to discover the what, what is uh, some uh, CO2 pathway to produce uh, those kind of some products. So uh, if you look at this diagram, it looks very complicated. So the way how we can control or steer the some pathway is to develop the some catalyst which can control the binding energy between this intermediate and the some catalyst surface. So for this purpose, uh, people are uh, developing the some heterogeneous catalyst to control the intermediate binding energy by the modification of these catalytic active sites. So these uh, catalysts are composed with uh, some uh, metallic uh, ions and the uh, metal atoms such as uh, some silver, some gold, palladium, or tin, they are very good for the producing the C1 chemicals. And uh, if we have some copper as an active material, and this is good for the, some producing the, some C2 chemicals because this copper enables the CC coupling and other some CO dimerization. So today, because the title of this uh, presentation is at the, some how to produce a multi-carbon chemicals, so we are going to talk about the copper-based catalyst today. And this is also very famous table, uh, which has been proposed by the some Hori. 
And uh, as you can see, according to the, some uh, type of elements in the, some catalyst, we can control the, some selectivity of the products from C1 to the C2. And uh, these are these selectivities can be uh, quantified by the some Faraday efficiency. So as you can, although this table has been proposed in some 1994, but uh, they have the, some similar some tendency in current states. So for example, if you look at this uh, silver, uh, gold or so silver, uh, zinc, they are very good for producing some CO, and uh, this is so similar in these days. And copper is the only one which can produce uh, like uh, ethylene and ethanol and other propanol, that kind of things. And these days, although at this time, the nickel, iron uh, have been uh, categorized into the, some uh, catalysts which can produce some hydrogen. But these days, with the aid of development of the single atom catalyst, such as uh, nickel uh, coordinated by nitrogen, they are very good catalysts for some CO production. So, uh, if also, so therefore, some today, so we are going to talk about this copper based catalyst uh, development research. So as I mentioned, to control the selectivity of the catalyst, it is very important uh, to design the, some catalyst uh, for our some targeted uh, products. So uh, there are a lot of some uh, aspects that we can uh, control the, some catalyst surface, such as the size. We can control the size. Also, we can control the facet of the catalyst. Also, we can control the morphology by doing some like uh, uh, surface design and also uh, to control the deep end center of the some catalyst surface, we can apply this kind of alloy strategy. It me alloy means there's some applying other some dopants to the some mother matrix based on the some copper. So most of my talk today would be related with this kind of some alloy. And so I'm going to propose propose how we can design this alloy catalyst to control the selectivity for the some CO2 or products. Also, with the with this catalyst point of view, we also uh, have to understand about the, some electrolyzers for the some CO two RR. So I think that some left hand side figure shows us very familiar some structures which which you can see easily in the, some our laboratory. So these we call as some H cell. So in H cell, the CO two gas is supplied to the aqueous electrolyte and the some CO2 reaction catalysts are located at the some surface of this cathode. So uh, for the CO2 reduction, it means that some uh, dissolved CO2 uh, should be reacted within the some aqueous electrolyte states. It means that some there can be the CO2 mass transport limitation uh, when it goes to the high current density CO2 reduction. Therefore, so people try to develop the some other some kind of some electrolyzers to enhance. Uh, the CO2 mass transport. So that is a reason why these days people are uh, doing the some CO2 R using this kind of some flow cell or the some ME cell. Uh, the uh, common points of them is that they all use uh, some uh, GDE based cathode. GDE is GDE means it's a gas diffusion electrolyte. The major difference between this H cell and some GDE based electrolyzers is that some how we how we supply CO2 to the catalyst. For example, in the case of flow cell and MA cell, because we use a GDE, which which has some porous structure, we can directly supply CO2 to the some catalyst from the backside of this uh, electrode. So by flowing this CO2 directly to this part, then so we can supply CO2 more efficiently. And this enables to overcome the some CO2 mass transport limitation. And in general, this kind of flow cell has some higher current density compared to this H cell. And this also have a very good effect yeah. by preventing the some HER. And the okay. In the case of the flow cell, the major difference of flow cell and some ME cell is the existence of the some liquid uh, catholite. In the case of the flow cell, there is some liquid catholite, and in the case of ME cell, there is a no uh, gap between the some uh, anion exchange membrane and some cathode. So the other, in other way, we call ME cell as some zero gap electrolyzer because there is no gap between the electrode and some membrane, and this provides a more stable operation. 
And because uh, I mentioned uh, uh, several times about this gas diffusion electrode, so to understand some basic phenomena in CO2R, it is very important how this GD works during the electrochemical reaction. So if you look at, uh, and there's a very good uh, review paper, uh, which has been published from the Nature Energy. So these provide a very good detailed information about the, some uh, structure and the, some uh, chemical reaction in the GDE. So in general, there are two types of the substrate for the GDE. First one would be the, some carbon paper, and the other one is a PTFE based uh, GDE uh, L. And the, some if we uh, incorporate the, some catalyst layer on the surface of GDE, and then, then this we can have the, some GDE. So in the GDE, because by we can uh, supply CO2 from the backside and uh, at the surface, and there is uh, some liquid uh, electrolyte is facing. So we have uh, some three phase boundary in this GDE, like a solid state catalyst and uh, some gas phase uh, CO2 and the liquid phase electrolyte. This is general, some, uh, and this we call it some three phase boundary. So uh, CO2R also can be occur at the surface of this boundary. Uh, also, these days, what we are very interested in is uh, about uh, how we can suppress this, this kind of some carbonate formation. Because the if we supply CO2 to the some this kind of some GDE, some CO2 can participate in the some CO2R, but others also can be directly flew to the aqueous electrolyte. And uh, if there is a lot of some hydroxide, and this will goes to the formation of this uh, carbonate. And uh, this is a major main reason to lower the CO2 conversion efficiency. So it means that it is very important to design the catalyst, and it is very important to design the, some GD structures to increase the, some CO2 conversion efficiency by suppressing this carbonate formation. So if you look at this more in detail, so there are some maybe uh, five, five uh, important metrics for the, some CO2R performance point of view. So first, we need to think about the, some Faraday efficiency, which is mostly related with the, some product selectivity. And this is a familiar some like uh, a performance to us. And if we uh, have the, some chance to uh, solve this selectivity issue, then we need to move on to the uh, production rate or productivity. And this can be uh, quantified by the partial current density. It means that some the this selectivity, if we apply the some current density to the some fairly efficiency, then we can have the some partial current density. And the, this partial current density means that some how fast and how how the production rate that we can achieve. And so I'm going to explain why this it is very difficult to get the high current density CO2R these days. And also we need to care about the like uh, CO2 conversion efficiency. Also, we need to think about the energy efficiency. And then finally, we need to care about the stability. So these are the some uh, major some metric performance metrics we need to care about in most cases. And then to so to enhance this kind of performance, it is very important to develop the catalyst and the GDE together. So these uh Slide also showed some progress of the some CO two R uh, in terms of the some partial current density which I mentioned. So in case of the uh, C one product, as you can see, uh, because this paper has been published in the some twenty twenty two. So if you look at this uh, year, the partial current density for the some C one product such as a CO or forming exit has been already achieved. Already they are close to the some one ampere. But in the case of the some C2 products such as uh, some acetylene and ethanol, there is a lot of void. It means that it is very difficult to get the high current density for the some C2 chemicals. If we, uh, the reason is simple. For the C1 uh, production, the C1 can be produced by directly from the some one CO2 molecule. But if we want to make uh, some C2 chemicals, there should be the step for the CC coupling and CC coupling can be achieved by this CO dimerization. It means the CO2 mass transport should be enhanced much more to get the high current density for the some production of the C2 chemical. 
So that is the reason why there is a less number of points in the some uh, C2 plus products in this map. So I, today I'm going to talk about our strategy to increase this production rate for these C2 chemicals. And these are the also some uh, performance map of what we need to uh, solve for the, some uh, commercialization of this CO2R technology. And uh, there are some, re some four representative products such as uh, CO and the forming acid are the some C1 product and some ethylene and ethanol would be the major C2 products. So we are going to talk about how we can make this kind of C2 chemicals more efficiently. So these are the some introduction of these slides. And uh, this page shows us an uh, introduction page of our group. So in our group, uh, we do the multi-scale research for the starting from the design of the active material. Then we uh, move to the some, uh, we are also doing the research for the some catalyst. Catalyst includes some active material and some supporter such as a carbon-based one. And also after we have some, this kind of some catalyst development and we need to care about the, some electro design because a uh, micro environment in GDE is also very important. And then we can move on to the electrolyzer system. So these three are the, my major research field for the, some CO2R. And today we are going to talk about this one. So uh, there are some three contents uh, uh, for this talk. So first, uh, as a first chapter, I'm going to uh, introduce about the active side and supporter interface design. And this is related with the controlling the selectivity between the some ethylene and the ethanol. And uh, in this way, I'm going to uh, introduce our recent paper to control the selectivity of them uh, by inducing the some alloy strategy. And the second part would be the catalyst reconstruction. This is also a very important topic because uh, although we uh, fabricate a very well uh, designed surface of the some catalyst, but when this catalyst participate in the, some electrochemical reaction and uh, the surface structure and the some phase can be changed during the catalytic reaction, it means that the, some the there exists a pre-catalyst and some real catalyst. So we need to understand how these pre-catalyst changes to the re uh, real catalyst. And third one would be the mass transport and some micro environment one. So in this way, I'm going to introduce how we can enhance the some current density for the high production rate for the co 2 Therefore, these three are the some major uh, uh, topic contents of the today presentation. And now we are going to start uh, from the some chapter one as a, some design of the active sites. So uh, as I briefly mentioned in the, some introduction, it is very important to control the selectivity between the hydrocarbon and the oxygenate. So in the case of C1, these can be the methane and the, some methanol. And in terms of the C2, these can be the ethanol and the, some uh, ethylene and the ethanol. So if you look at this uh, ethylene and ethanol pathway, uh, after they get uh, some CO dimerization, then they can make a CC coupling to produce uh, some C2 product. And after they share the some same uh, reaction pathway, and there can be the ethanol pathway and some there can be the ethylene pathway. And in general, it is very difficult to control the some selectivity between the ethanol and ethylene because of uh, uh, we need to develop the catalyst which can promote CC coupling. Also, these should be also selective to the some ethanol or this should be selective to the ethylene. But in general, it is more uh, easy to produce ethanol, ethylene because the ethylene pathway is a major uh, one for the C2 chemical uh, production. So if we want to develop those catalysts which can steer the pathway between them, and we need to suppress the ethylene selectivity, and then we need to increase the ethanol selectivity uh, by developing the, some new catalysts. And these are the some purpose of this chapter one. So to control the pathway, then some we need to have the uh, control the some uh, binding energy of the intermediates by applying the some alloying. So it means that some we have a copper as a major active site 
and the, if we apply some other elements, which can tune the binding energy of the some uh, intermediates, and we can control the selectivity between the ethylene and ethanol. And our uh, research has been started uh, from this idea. So it means that some, if we imagine, uh, then we can uh, make a copper and silver alloy. And although they have some same comp composition, but their interface can be different. It means that some copper, silver can be separated or they can be mixed together. So in this way, what would be the ideal interface for this copper, silver based alloy? And then to, uh, to study uh, this idea, first we did uh, some calculation about the, to compare the some uh, uh, activation energy uh, for the to control the some ethylene and ethanol pathway uh, in terms of the copper rich side and some copper silver interface. And all, when you compare this one, the major conclusion is that the, because we both need a copper rich side and we also need a copper silver interface. It means that some, uh, we need to have this kind of supersaturate or uh, solid solution based one. It means that some, there should be the copper silver and copper copper size together. But in general, because uh, in thermodynamic point of view, copper silver can be, uh, e they are easy to be separated because they are uh, categorized as uh, uh, some immiscible, some alloy. In this way, we, we had to think about how we can make this kind of supersaturated solid solution by overcoming this kind of some limited interface. So in that way, we uh, we had an idea of the by applying this kind of alloy and dealloy strategy. It means that some instead of directly mixing the copper and silver uh, together, then so we can apply third elements which can be dissolved into the copper and silver together. So after we have the, some this kind of tonnery phase alloy, then we can selectively etch these B atoms which is used for the, some sacrificial one. In that way, uh, by designing the, this kind of some three uh, ternary phase alloy, then we can have a chance to make a solid solution uh, copper silver alloy by doing this alloy, uh, the alloy process. In that way, this metal A could be the metal one, which can control the selectivity of the copper, and the metal B should be the uh, element which can provide us this kind of pore structure at the D alloy. To design this kind of some ternary phase alloy, there should be the, we need to think about the, some two major uh, descriptors to design to design this kind of some uh, copper alloy system. First one is uh, some oxidation tendency. It means that some, because of when it do the D alloy process, we put this uh, ternary phase alloy to the some exit. It means that the, some after D alloy, this uh, dopant B should be selectively rich up. It means they have, should be have they should have the, some higher oxidation tendency than the some copper one, and also we need to care about the miscibility with the copper, and this kind of miscibility can be uh, understood by the activity coefficient uh, terms. This is a thermodynamic point, and uh, some we can get this uh, activity coefficient by doing the thermodynamic calculation. So. What it did is we use some fixage uh, thermal, thermal chemical program. And uh, if when you calculate the activity coefficient according to the, some type of the metal, then so we can get this kind of curve. So in the case of this silver, because of their slope is larger than one, so their activity coefficient is larger than one. So in this way, we categorize them as some immiscible one. And in the case of zinc, it has uh, some their activity coefficient is lower than one. It means that they are very miscible to the copper. So uh, with the, uh, based on this point of view, so with the calculation for the some, all series of the some uh, metallic elements, and we found that some zinc are easy to be mixed with the copper and the uh, z silver is uh, immiscible with the copper. It means it doesn't mix. So, uh, to study about uh, some metal alloy system, uh, we categorize the zinc and the copper in terms of the, some activity coefficient. So as I mentioned, 
if the activity coefficient is lower than one, it means the copper and zinc are easy to be mixed. And in the case of copper and silver, uh, their uh, activity coefficient is larger than one. It means that they are immiscible. So we focus on this um, copper and silver. And as I mentioned, we have to apply the third elements to control the interface between copper and silver. And then we choose some aluminum as a third element. Aluminum can be mixed to the copper and silver simultaneously, and they have higher oxidation tendency than copper and silver. It means aluminum can be selectively leached out uh, when you put this oil into the uh, exit. So in the copper silver, uh, because we need to control the interface between the copper and silver one, Dioloi, after Dioloi. So uh, we uh, first we control the composition between the copper, silver, and aluminum, and then we also control the, some cooling rate. So these two are the are the to control the interface between copper silver at the final state. So in this way. First, we had to find the optimal copper structure, which can produce C2 products a lot. So in this way, first, we started from the designing the binary phase first. After we find the optimal uh, composition, which can produce a lot of C2 chemicals, then we started to mix the silver to, the, to this composition. And this enabled to uh, find the, some optimal point, which can control the some selectivity between the ethylene and ethanol. So I'm going to introduce one by one. At first, as I mentioned, first we need to find some what would be the optimal ratio between the copper and aluminum because of after do the after the dioloid, then we can have the porous copper in that way. So left hand side shows some phase diagram between the aluminum and copper, and according to their composition, we can get their some uh, interface into the hypoeutetic, near eutetic, and hyperutetic. In this way, uh, we can have the various kind of thing. And in that way, we found that some near eutectic one had uh, some very uh, highest C2 uh, products uh, selectivity. And then also we control uh, some cooling rate to get uh, some uh, optimal interface between copper and aluminum, which can produce the uh, uh, high, highest uh, C2 products fairly efficiency. And this by controlling the cooling rate, because in this way, the way how we make this alloy is that some, uh, after we mix the, some metal, and the, some, we increase the temperature, which can lower, uh, which can melt these two uh, solids into the liquids. After that, we cool down to, to have the, some solid. By doing this process, we can get the, some alloy uh, fabrication. And then the cooling rate means that the, some, the uh, speed of the temperature decrease uh, from the liquid to the solid state alloy. And as you can see, according to the cooling rate design, we can we could control the some uh, width of the lamella structure, which is composed with the, some aluminum copper. So based on this uh, procedure, we could get the optimal condition, which can produce a C2 product uh, FE. And then uh, we had to, uh, after we confirmed the, some composition, maximum composition, which can produce C2 chemical, then we started to put the, some silver in it to control the selectivity between hydrocarbon and the, some oxygenate. So uh, as we put the, some silver in it, then the, we can have the three phase at the alloy process. That is uh, aluminum and silver aluminum and the aluminum copper. It means that some by controlling the uh, contents of the silver to the some aluminum copper alloy, then we can control the ratio between the these three phases at uh, before the alloy. Then by controlling this uh, ratio between them, uh, then if if we put this alloy to the some acid, and this enables to leach the some aluminum, and the rest of the silver and copper can form the some different interfaces because the, the original rate uh, original uh, ratio between them has been controlled by according to the silver addition. So in this way, we found uh, that some 5% and some 15% uh, interface uh, can be changed. So for example, in the case of the 5% silver, after we do the dioloid, then the, so when you see the some copper silver, we found they formed the, some phase separated copper silver interface. 
And this is uh, some general, some interface uh, which we can predict uh, from the from the visibility of the copper and silver. Interestingly, when we mixed 15% silver contents to this alloy, we could fabricate the uh, we could fabricate this supersaturate uh, silver copper solid solution. It means that some some copper are mixed to the silver and some parts are separated. So these are the some like a quasi based quasi mixed uh, states. Uh, this is different with this totally uh, separated one. And we could uh, quantify and we could analyze uh, their interface by using this kind of XAPS, EOS, and some XRD measurement. So after that, uh, we measured uh, some CO2 R performance of this alloy. So for example, and we measured this MEA, uh, we measured the CO2 R performance of this alloy uh, in the, some MEA electrolyzers, which I introduced at the first uh, page. So in the case of the some dialloid copper, it means that there is no silver in it. So uh, x axis shows the some uh, potential, and the left hand side y axis shows the ferry efficiency, and the right hand side y axis shows the some uh, current density. As you can see, as we increase the potential, then we can see the at the low potential range, we can see the existence of the some CO in it, and if we keep increasing the potential, you know, we can see the decrease of the CO, and the, this decrease CO contributes to the increase of the some ethylene. It means that some in dialloid copper, the major product is a ethylene, the hydrocarbon one. And if we put the silver in it, and the, if we look at the some five percent, uh, in the case of a uh, five percent one, the low potential range are similar. The major product is a CO. And uh, although the silver 5% CO contribute to lower the some ethylene from the 70 to the some 40% FE, but uh, there is no high FE for the some ethanol. But if we make uh, some uh, uh, supersaturated uh, silver copper interface, we found that the, this decreased CO contributes to the increase of the ethanol. And so in this case, there is a low SLN FE. It means that some, uh, although we put the silver in it, but uh, it is very important to design the, some interface between the silver and copper together. So in that way, uh, in the case of pure copper, the, there are some uh, ethanol to ethylene ratio was very low. It means the major CO2 our products are ethylene. But in the case of the 15% uh, one, it means the supersaturated copper silver interface. These are very effective to produce uh, ethanol. And in the case of zinc, they have a very low, because zinc, although I didn't present in today's uh, presentation, but zinc is very visible. And uh, some, it is very difficult to control the uh, interface between copper and zinc. So it means there is no big uh, effect when he, although we put the zinc, uh, although we increase the contents of the zinc to the some this copper zinc alloy. So it means that this uh, result represents the importance of the some interface design uh, for the some copper uh, alloy. So if you look, if you compare the some uh, performance of the some ethylene and ethanol in terms of the ferritic efficiency and the partial current density, uh, although these are the some not record one, but the most uh, interesting point from this one is that the some this is the first book to convert the very, very highly selective ethylene catalyst into the uh, highly selective ethanol one. So in this way, we could find how we can control the selectivity between the ethylene and ethanol uh, in this way. And to understand why these catalysts are effective for the some design, uh, effective for controlling the ethylene and ethanol selectivity, we did uh, some in situ Raman study. And we found because the, uh, in the case of supersaturated silver copper one, we found some uh, other site transition from terrace to the step site. And we found these are very effective to uh, enhance uh, some ethanol production. So these are the, so how we designed the, some catalyst surface to control the selectivity. And now I'm going to move on to the some second part for the to understand the, some the reconstruction of the catalyst. So as I mentioned, it is very important to understand about the reconstruction because uh, although we fabricate the catalyst surface, but during the catalyst, during the CO2RR, 
the surface structure can be changed uh, because uh, this is also related with uh, some electrochemical potential and the pH of the electrolyte and the reaction time. So these are the, some general the mechanism uh, how this reconstruction occurs because uh, when the catalysts are contact with uh, some uh, aqueous electrolyte and that there can be the dissolution of the some metal ions to the electrolytes. And then if we start to apply the some reductive potential, these dissolved metal ions can be redeposited to the surface of the catalyst. This is a way how this reconstruction can occur. So uh, in previously, it was very difficult to see this kind of reconstruction because if we just compare the before and after states, uh, after states means that some the uh, there is no reductive potential, and so we need to open the cell again. It means that so during this procedure, the uh, reduced states can be reoxidized. But important thing is that we are interested about the what is a real uh, phase and structure during the CO2R under the reductive potential. So in, there is a reason, that is a reason why these days, this kind of operando and in-situ measurement are very important in the CO2R. For example, if you look at this right-hand side one, uh, this is a, this uh, figure show the some uh, in-situ XAS uh, reactor, which we use in the, some synchrotron. So for example, uh, if we measure this XAS, we can see the how the uh, oxidation states and the coordination uh, number of copper changes during the cell operation. So as you can see, this peak show the bonding with the copper oxygen, and this peak show the bonding with the copper copper. Uh, as the reaction starts, we can see the decrease of the copper oxygen peak in here. This indicates the, some the lower lower uh, the number lowering the number of the copper oxygen bonding, and we can see the increase of some peak in this copper copper. It means that some copper copper bonding increase. This is related with the, some uh, reductive potential induced uh, copper copper reconstruction. So we are we are going to study and so we need to figure out how we can manage this kind of reconstruction. So the second part, second chapter is related with this kind of phenomena. So uh, at first time, we wanted to uh, suppress and we wanted to prevent this kind of reconstruction. And uh, we thought we want to make uh, some like a protective, protective shell, which can prevent uh, some uh, struct severe structure and uh, some uh, phase uh, evolution during the co -tar. So we focused on fabricating uh, some carbon shell on the surface of the copper. And because this is a different way in compared to the some uh, conventional method, because uh, if we just uh, deposit carbon on the surface of the copper, and this can block the active sites, and it means that the, some this carbon shell should be very uh, porous, and this should be the, some very uh, very uh, porous, and the, some this should be this should be enable the, some uh, atomic and the ion transport. So in that way, what we found is that the, some, we wanted to fabricate this kind of some carbon shell uh, from the by using the, some gas solid reaction. So this kind of reaction we call as a, some uh, boudoir reaction. It means this carbon can be solid carbon can be precipitated from the uh, CO by the reaction with the, some CO and CO2. So it means that some if we do the some calcination in the by using the some this carbon and the some copper, and the, we can get the some CO and CO2 by the oxidation of this carbon. And then by controlling the some temperature and the pressure, then the, we can induce the uh, reaction direction to the fabrication of the solid carbon on the surface of copper. So we design this kind of some procedure based on this thermodynamic principle. So we also did some uh, backstage calculation to see the what would be the optimal processing window to produce this kind of some carbon precipitation. In that way, we could induce the, some like a, a reverse uh, Buddha reaction to produce some carbon shell on the surface of copper. So these are the, some results. How 
after this, by applying this kind of Buddha reaction, doing the, some uh, thermal calcination procedure. So if when we have uh, some this kind of copper active sites, and uh, these are located in the, some carbon uh, supporter, this kind of carbon fiber. And uh, if we look at the surface of the copper, uh, by doing this gas solid reaction, we could fabricate this kind of some causal graffiti carbon shell on the surface of copper. So we found this carbon shell, and so when you look at this TM in the in the various uh, direction, this carbon shell was coated uh, uniformly. And then we compare the some structures of the copper and before and after. In the case of bare copper and uh, some uh, copper with uh, some carbon shell. So if you look at this left hand side one, uh, before there is a huge structure change between the before and after seal tara in the, some conventional copper. But in the case of the carbon encapsulated copper one, we can see that some the copper structure has been maintained. It means that some, uh, although there can be the, some reconstruction, but the, some their structure has not been changed severely. So interesting point is that because of these carbon uh, not only uh, protect the, some copper active site, but also this enables the penetration of the some ions. It means that some although we can have the, some carbon shell, uh, we when it did the, some doping with the, some uh, boron, then the other some uh, nitrogen, we found uh, this nitrogen can penetrate the, some carbon shell and some this can dope copper in it. So it means that some our that is the reason why our carbon shell is very uh, effective for the CO2 and the, some preventing the reconstruction together. So by based by using this strategy, uh, we compare the CO two R in the flow cell. In the case of the pristine copper, it only produces a carbon a CO. But in the case of the when we do the, some nitrogen doping, then we could enhance some SLM production, and we found the optimal uh, dopant in here. And by applying this kind of causal graffiti carbon shell, we could operate a very stable CO two R. And some of these were effective to the production of the SLN for a very long time, uh, over the 180 hours. So these are the some strategy how we uh, suppress or some prevent the some acyl, uh, copper reconstruction. And then uh, we are also going to move on to the how we can understand the uh, reconstruction of the copper, not only in the some metallic surface, but also into the some morph, like a uh, metal ions incorporated system. So in in these days, there's a uh, these kind of some uh, molecular augmented uh, strategy uh, received a great attention to enhance the selectivity and enhance the energy efficiency. It means that some by these are the strategy to combine with the, some uh, heterogeneous metallic surface to the molecular uh, molecular add layers, and most metal organic framework also can be used in this strategy for the heterogeneous CO two reduction catalyst. And as you can see, this one MOF has a very finely controlled some porous structure, and this is very good for the uh, gas capture. It means that some it can enhance the some uh, local CO two concentration, but uh, what I found in MOF is a so MOF stability is also related with the reconstruction, which I uh, introduced uh, previously. So, for example, because uh, I'm going to explain more in detail this one, MOF is composed with the, some metal center and the organ linker. So in general, when we categorize MOF and some, there is a, some metal center, we can categorize MOF according to the metal center. And uh, I found that uh, this MOF, uh, the metal, uh, oxygen tendency of the metal in MOF are very important to uh, understand the some reconstruction of the MOF. For example, we can have the copper-based MOF and also we can have the zirconium based MOF. And uh, their oxidation tendency can be understood by this kind of some uh, reduction potential. And we can also get the information about this Kapuve diagram. In the case of copper, this is very reductive metal. It is very, it is very easy to be reduced. 
So there is a region in the in the in the case of this potential, the metallic copper is a stable one. But in the case of zirconium, it is less reductive than copper. It means it's a relatively this is an oxidative metal in the case of this kind of zirconium. So there is a reason why the zirconium exists as a, some this prefers to exist as some uh, positively charged ions in this uh, potential range. So in this way, I think about the, the reconstruction of the mold would be different according to this type of metal. So uh, what we did is that we also did uh, some measurement of the, some operando XAS. And uh, when we plot the XAPS, then we found very interesting phenomena. For example, in the case of copper-based one, as I mentioned, this is very reductive, easy to be reduced. So this graph showed us some operand accepts result, and uh, this is the radial distance, and uh, this axis showed us some reaction time. And uh, this peak showed the copper oxygen bonding. In the mole, copper ions are correlated by the oxygen. And when the reaction starts, means that if you apply the potential, then the these will degrade it, and uh, this copper copper we found this copper copper bonding keep increase. It means that some the copper dimer in uh, HKOS one being reduced to produce a copper cluster and copper nanoparticle. This is a uh, uh, this shows some reconstruction of the copper based mode. In this way, mold structure will be changed, and this uh, copper. Uh, contributes to maintaining this porous structure, but this copper is being reduced to fabricate the, some nanoparticle or cluster. But in the case of zirconium, as I show, there is no change for the some uh, coordinate number of the zinc, uh, zirconium in this way. It means although the reaction start, zirconium, zirconium, uh, number of zirconium, zirconium does not increase. And the, we can see a lot of the zirconium oxygen bond in here. It means the zirconium does not uh, participate in some reconstruction. So in this way, I try to uh, explain this. So we need to uh, make a different uh, point of view to understand the MOV. So copper-based MOV can be applied as some active material, but this kind of zirconium-based MOV can be applied to the supporter because this is very stable. So I'm going to introduce about the, how what I did for by using this kind of copper-based MOV. So as you can see, this copper-based mold is composed with uh, some uh, uh, copper dimers in here as a secondary building units. And this is similar with uh, some copper acetate. And we found this copper is reduced to produce a copper. So what I did is uh, why I tried to distort the symmetric structure of this copper dimer by applying uh, some thermal treatment. It means that so when I did a summer uh, calcination at this temperature, I found the decomposition of this uh, carboxylic uh, organic linker. And this uh, induced uh, some asymmetric structure of these copper dimers. And this was, we could find this kind of phenomena by using this EPR measurement. It means that some detachment of this carboxylic group in pedaling structured copper dimer, uh, then this promoted the uh, undercoordinate sites in the copper. And by varying the time at this uh, thermal treatment, we found the, this kind of some copper dimer uh, asymmetric structure are effective for the, some acetylene production. For example, in the case of the just symmetric copper dimer, the major product was a hydrogen and the hydrogen and the, some CO. But as we, if we keep increase, uh, keep detach the, some carboxylate group and to make the copper dimer into the asymmetric one, we found the ethylene Fe has been increased. So it means the, there could be the, some reason why this kind of asymmetric uh, copper dimer is effective for the, some ethylene production, although they started from the same material. So we measured the, some in-situ measure, uh, in-situ XAS, uh, which I showed before, and the, we, uh, compared the some coordination number of the copper copper. And interestingly, we found uh, as a copper dimer being more asymmetric, 
and we found the copper copper coordination number has been decreased. It means that some symmetry copper dimer induced the copper copper with the high coordination number, but the asymmetry copper dimer induced the uh, low copper copper coordination number of, during the some CO2R. It means that we could find some relationship with the, some coordination number and this kind of ethylene production. So in this way, uh, we know we now know this dimer will go to the copper cluster. But I found a way how we can control the coordination number of this copper cluster by modifying this uh, symmetry of uh, symmetry of this copper dimer. So in the case of uh, symmetry copper dimer, this will produce a this produce a high copper copper coordination number copper cluster. But if we make a, this kind of asymmetry copper dimer, this produces a low uh, copper copper coordination number copper cluster. And we found this kind of SLN FE trend is can be explained reversely by the copper copper coordination number. It means low coordination number copper is effective for the SLN production. So this is how we can uh, develop the, some uh, copper-based mode for the some CO2 reduction catalyst. So the left hand side shows the, some the result which I present uh, before, present now. And the right hand side, because uh, I think you will remember, although copper undergoes a reduction-based reconstruction, but this zirconium is very stable. So in this way, but zirconium is not good active material, active sites for the co 2 In that way, we can use this zirconium base morph as a supporter. And then if we incorporate this kind of other active material like a silver or copper, then this can be very good tool to control the some micro environment of this active material. And in this work, because zirconium does not is very stable during the steel tar, we use as a supporter for the some silver nanoparticle. And we found this according to the some pore site uh, design, we could control the steel tar activity of this silver. And uh, this is uh, how we can understand and we can manage this reconstruction of the material during the CO2 reduction. So, so far I presented about the active site design and some reconstruction issue. And uh, I think, Sorry for the yeah, time because it's already have passed the uh, yeah, 57 now. So I'm going to present uh, more uh, briefly. And third one would be the, so how we can increase uh, some like a core density by controlling the some micro environment of the some gas diffusion electrode. So as I previously showed before, these MOF are very effective for the capturing the CO2. And the GD when these are applied to the some GDE. So in this way, uh, compared to the some bare copper, some these kind of some uh, most incorporated GDE are very effective to increasing the some partial core density of the ethylene. The reason why it is very difficult to increase the partial core density is that the we can can be understood by this graph. For example, in the case of bare copper PTFE GDE, uh, there can be the optimal potential or current density where we can have the highest FE for the uh, ethylene. But if we keep increasing the potential, uh, we can see the increase of the hydrogen and decrease of the ethylene. This is because of the some uh, limited CO2 mass transport in the some GDE. But if we enhance this kind of phenomenon, then limitation, then we can have the we can maintain the selectivity to the high current density. And these will go to increasing the partial current density for this product. So this move is also very effective for the CO2 mass transport. And then, then I'm going to introduce uh, our very recent work uh, to inc to how you could manage the some micro environment of the uh, GDE. So we use uh, some vitamin C, other name is uh, ascorbic acid as an agent to uh, convert, uh, to promote the CO2 capture to the copper surface. It means uh, this ascorbic acid has some redox, re uh, redox as a, some, because if this ascorbic acid 
uh, to is being oxidized, and this will go to DHA, and this can donate uh, some uh, electron. And then if we do the reduction of this DHA, and this will go to the ascorbic acid. So there is a reason why when it's stored the fruits in the, some CO2 rich atmosphere, and the, this ascorbic acid very easy to be oxidized. Uh, inspired by from this phenomena, and we try to apply this kind of ascorbic acid to the surface of the copper. It means uh, ascorbic acid can promote the formation of the CO from the CO2 because uh, these two, this is a uh, uh, RDS uh, for the CO formation. And uh, if we promote the electron and uh, proton transfer, and this will help to produce the uh, increase the coverage of the CO, and this will be very effective to enhance the current density. So we try to put this ascorbic acid on the surface of the copper. And there is an issue for the, when you apply this kind of ascorbic acid, because ascorbic acid very easy to be dissolved to the aqueous electrolyte. So it means that so we had to find a way how we can confine this ascorbic acid on the surface of the copper as a heterogeneous catalyst. And we use uh, some uh, graphene quantum dot to as uh, some ascorbic acid immobilization sites. It means that some by doing the uh, by combining this GQD with the ascorbic acid, we could confine this ascorbic acid uh, to the some catalyst surface. And this is also very important because uh, for the continuous redox cycle, the electron should be supplied from the electrode. In this way, this ascorbic acid should be confined in this way, uh, in the carbon-based supporter. And uh, this kind of some redox transition also has been also reported recently also in other paper. And we try to apply this kind of principle to our catalyst. So for example, uh, in the case of bare copper nanowire, uh, if we increase uh, some potential at the first time, we can have a high ethylene FE. But as we can expect, if we increase the potential, increase the current density, then the ethylene FE degrade because of the some uh, CO2 mass transport limitation. Uh, I'm going to show this one. But in the case of the ascorbic acid with the graphene quantum dot, this is a very, this is a, a, our major result. Unlike this one, we can see a existence of the CO at the low potential. It means that some, the CO production has been promoted at the, some low potential range. And then, although we increase the potential, but this, not, this does not go to the decrease of the acetylene, but the acetylene FE maintains, and instead CO decrease. It means that the promoted uh, CO2 to CO uh, conversion has a merit of the converting CO to the acetylene. In this way, although we keep increasing the potential, you know, we could maintain the, some FE for the acetylene to the high current density region. It's almost close to the, some one ampere uh, per centimeter scale. In this way, we could enhance the, some partial current density of the acetylene compared to the other one. Uh, and uh, it was over the uh, 500 milliampere. And uh, this result is located at this one. And also to uh, elucidate the role of this ascorbic acid, we also measure the CO2R in the, some CO2 deficient condition. It means that some, because of if ascorbic acid has an effect of the capturing the CO2 and to form the CO on the surface of the copper, then so this should be also be effective in the, some CO2 deficient condition. And when you compare it to the copper nanowire and some ascorbic acid one, we found very interesting result. In the case of the bare copper, in the case of low CO2 concentration, the hydrogen was a major because there was a CO2 concentration was very low. But in the case of the ascorbic base one, because ascorbic acid can promote the CO2 to CO conversion. So although we lower the CO2 ratio, but uh, we could have the, some, we could maintain the FA or the uh, acetylene over the 40 percent. So this also this result also supports the role of the some ascorbic acid as a, some CO2 capturing agent. And when we measure the operand excess, we found there is no big difference in the, some copper active sites. It means that some ascorbic acid can work independently as a, some uh, CO2 capture agent on the surface of the heterogeneous catalyst. And uh, when we measure the in situ Raman, then we found compared to the copper, bare copper, in the case of the ascorbic based copper nanowire, 
we found a lot of some CO coverage compared to this bare one. So it means that some, this ascorbic acid promoted the CO2 to CO conversion. And this also had an effect of controlling the CO breach and auto ratio. And some, these also uh, promoted the production of the, some acid in this way. So yeah, also the, it has been over the some one hour. So sorry for the late, uh, long, some delayed or some presentation, but uh, so today uh, I present, introduce about the three major strategies for the, some CO2 reduction catalyst. First topic was the, how we can control the selectivity between the ethylene and ethanol. And second one was about the, some, how we can understand the reconstruction and how we can manage the reconstruction by applying the, some protective carbon shell. And this is very important for the, some stability and the, some like uh, uh, maintaining the selectivity. And third one, would be the how we can increase the production rate of the CO2 reduction. And this could be obtained by the managing the some micro environment of the GDE. And I today I introduce about the ascorbic acid as an agent for the CO2 to CO conversion. So uh, these are the today's my talk and the, some yeah I'd like to express my thanks to my students in DGIST. Yeah and thanks for your attention. Hi, Dr. Lang. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Yeah, for three parts. Very interesting work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, yeah, I just uh, pay attention to the number of audiences in the early BDBD yeah, website. Yeah, more than 4,000 uh, audiences are listening to your talk. Yeah, oh, quite high wow. the number. <laughs> yeah, this is a live platform. So, later, I, so if you have questions, uh, yeah, you can directly ask uh, Dr. Lan. Also in Zoom, yeah, for those in Zoom, you can direct directly communicate with Dr. Lan. Okay, so also I have first I have uh one question. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, yeah, yeah, for three parts, yeah, you mentioned. Uh, for second part, uh, uh, for MOF, HKUST yeah. MOF and yeah. UIO CT six MOF, these two yeah. kinds of MOF. Yeah, you mentioned uh, during the CO two R. Not so stable for HKUST more. Yeah. Yeah. So copper ion will be reduced to copper clusters or nanoparticles after yeah. reduction. So <laughs> I have one question. Just like the uh, part one and part uh, for part one, uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, first separated uh, copper and silver can yeah. improve the selectivity towards the uh, acid or ethanol. Yeah, just control the selectivity. So yeah. for this part, I think also I think uh, uh, after reduction, especially increase reaction time. The copper ions will be partially reduced, maybe uh, when you control the reaction time. Uh, some copper ions will be reduced to copper clusters or or little particles you mentioned. But um, I, I think uh, maybe still, especially in the inner part, uh, still the copper ions uh, in the both uh, can be maintained. So in this case, uh, do you think uh, the copper ion and the metallic copper will synergistic effect or improve the selectivity? Uh, towards it, especially for carbon tools, uh, C2 products, or just only oh. the contribution for, for early component particles or, or clusters. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for a very uh, important uh, topic of my this uh, CO2 reduction catalyst. Yeah, this is you pointed out very important things. And uh, as I mentioned about this one, uh, copper, as because of uh, because we applied some negative potential for the CO2 reduction, and uh, this can reduce not only the CO2, but uh, this can also reduce the uh, metal ions in the some catalyst surface. So there is a reason why we could see this kind of some excess graph according to the time. So it means that the, some when it compared to the some zero quantum and copper, in this case, copper we found copper is reduced. In this is not limited to this kind of HKUST one. If we use uh, some like a copper porphyrin or copper phthalocyanin, other kind of organometallic complex, although copper originate or uh, start from the some single atom, but the, this will be reduced to form the some copper cluster and the or copper nanoparticles. So this kind of phenomenon can also be uh, shown in the this kind of.
yeah, this kind of alloy, it means the some because of at the in the case of mo, because of in the mo copper is uh starts from the some single atom. So it means that some, it is more effective to be to change their structure by doing the reconstruction. In the case of these kind of some alloy system, because they are relatively more bulk scale than some single atom copper. So it means that some, although there can be the reconstruction of the copper at the surface, but at the major part, they would maintain their some original interface. So it means that some, as you can see, uh, because if we uh, compare to the XRD before and after CO2RR, this is a phase separated copper silver and this is super saturated uh, silver copper. As you can see, their XLDP also changes be between before, after, before, after. But what I want to say, because of, although they changes during the CO2RR, because of this phase separated one maintains their original structures and some of their interface are so, uh, slightly changes. And in the case, in the same way, the super saturated one, there are some like a uh, surface structure slightly can be changed. But when you compare the after CO2RR states, with this one, this one, and they also have the difference, maintain their difference between the supersaturated one and phase separated one. So it means that some, uh, it is also very important to, to how uh, to understand the reconstruction in copper in bulk scale. And what I want to say in this one is that some, although they undergo the reconstruction, but their different interfaces uh, are uh, maintained. So that would be the reason why we, why we could see the different uh, co 2 uh, some selectivity in this point. But I totally agree when this copper, the dimension of the copper keep decrease, the effect of reconstruction will become more severe, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your detailed response. Thank you, and I okay. understand, understand. So any questions, Yinsu? Yeah, for those Yinsu, do you have any questions? Uh, no, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. It was very informative. Um, actually, I would like to ask, like most of your work, like uh, when you perform the electrochemical application of CO2 RI, you mostly use gas to an electrode. Yeah. So I would like to ask, in the starting, you have mentioned like there is a challenge uh, while performing CO2 RR, uh, there is a challenge of carbonate formation. Yeah, that's right. So um, how these catalysts can help you to reduce or suppress this carbonate form formation when you were uh, apply, uh, when you were uh, just doing all these application like reconstruction or uh, the high selectivity. So because when there will be carbonate formation, CO2 RR will be uh, suppressed or it will be reduced. So there is also uh, the challenge is still existing. Yeah, you also pointed out very important things because the uh, today I. The, my strategy uh, is not because it's a different strategy for the to solve this carbon information. It means that some uh, today because I mentioned about the catalyst surface and the yes. catalyst reconstruction and the uh, micro environment to produce the to enhance the some mass transport is right. Yes. For the carbonate formation, because we can see in this equation, it is very important to manage this hydroxide one. It means uh, there is also very a lot of the review papers. So in general, at the first time, we did a CO2R in the, some alkaline uh, electrolyte, which has a lot of hydroxide in that. And yes. as we know, high pH condition is very good to promote the CC coupling. It means the, it has a merit of the increasing selectivity. But uh, the merit of this alkaline is a uh, there can be a lot of carbonate formation. So there is a way, there is a reason why these days people are trying to move from alkaline electrolyte to the neutral, and from but the neutral electrolyte there is a less hydroxide is right compared to the yes. KOH based alkaline one. But uh, neutral electrolyte would be the best one. But the limit of the uh, neutral is a, it has a high over potential, is right? It means that it has a low energy efficiency. So if it goes to the some acidic CO2R, there can be the very low hydroxide, is right? Then uh, in 
In fact, uh, acidic CO2 reduction is very effective to prevent this carbon inflammation. So it means that some, if we keep doing the, uh, this kind of strategy, which can be applied to the acidic co 2 then this will be very effective for the carbon inflammation. So although I didn't present uh, about this acidic co 2 today, but the, that will be my the future work because of these, these are very effective for the, some carbon inflammation. No, oh, thank you so much. Looking forward. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, uh, also our staff uh, have collected some questions from okay. other different uh, live platforms. So I will ask a question on behalf of the audiences. Oh, thank you. So first question, the audience mentioned, uh, uh, what's the reason that MEA, yeah, MEA you mentioned, MEA mm -hmm. shows better stability in CO2R test than flow cell, uh, except for using or not using electrolyte. So what's the intrinsic reason? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, this is the first question from the audience. Yeah. Okay, also this is very important <laughs> because the yeah. questions are very, yeah, excellent. And some very, you, are, you pointed out very uh, critical issues in CO2R. So uh, in fact, uh, I cannot explain in, because of we, there are a lot of some very complicated phenomena in this way. The reason why I mentioned ME is more stable is based on the, some experience first. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the, some, there can be the issue because uh, in MEA, uh, in the surface of the some cathode where the CO2 occurs, there is no liquid electrolyte and the membrane is uh, directly uh, located on the surface of it without gap. Uh, in the full cell, we can see the bubble generation because uh, if we keep flowing the CO2 and the, some, if we keep inducing the CO2 reduction, and the, in the case of cathodite, the, there can be the bubble generation continuously in the surface of the, some CO2 electrocatalyst. But in MEA, because uh, there's no uh, liquid electrolyte, but although we provide some like a humidified CO2, but uh, I think this kind of bubble generation in flow cell would be the major issue why it lowers the uh, stability of the cell operation. So if you look at the papers about the which reports uh, about the stability over the 100 hours, in most cases, they use the MEA cell. And this is also a very good topic we also try to do, but uh, in experience, yeah, using the MEA is more stable to operate over the 100 hours, yeah. And I think that will be originate from the existence of the, some liquid electrolytes on the surface of cathode, I think, yeah. Okay, thanks for your reply. Yeah. And uh, the, another question for the audience, uh, uh, as also you mentioned, uh, many strategies uh, such as facet, morphology, alloy, are efficient mm -hmm. in converting uh, carbon dioxide to C2 products. So do you think uh, these strategies will work as well for C C3 products. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, another question for the audience. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because uh, although I mentioned about this uh, C1 and C2 product is right, uh, because our goal is to keep increasing the some number of carbons in the some one product. So in some, there is some reports that uh, copper can produce uh, some small amount of some propanol in the case of things. I, I believe that some, if we keep doing the research about the copper uh, copper catalyst design, I think there can be the room to increase uh, some selectivity for the, some C3 products. But I think so far, the reason why the, we could not uh, discover the very good, excellent copper active sites for the C3 chemical is a uh, reconstruction, I think, because although we make this kind of facet size and some morphology and some like alloy system, but they all undergo some reconstruction. And so far, it was very difficult to understand how the surface or how the facet changes. And it means that some this can, although we make some ideal, some interface, which can produce some C2 pro, C3 products, but this can be degraded or some this can be changed in another other way. 
So if we find a way how to manage or the, some uh, handle this reconstruction by maintaining the some active sites or the induced reconstruction for the some like a uh, very active for the systemic chemical production, and that will be the uh, our some future way that we need to do focus. Yeah. So I also want to make yeah sister product, but I couldn't so far. Yeah. Yeah, so difficult now, still not so yeah, easy. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. So, any other questions? Uh, welcome to directly communicate with Dr. Lai. No question now? Okay, so uh, also I have another question. Yeah, just now you yes, mentioned yeah. Uh, yeah, for part, part two, yeah, yes. so second work, you mentioned the carbon uh, layer. Where oh, yes. uh, we okay. count on the surface of copper, uh, improve improve the selectivity towards C two products. Yes. So, uh, what paper I, I forget the uh, journal. Uh, just control the thickness of the carbon layer, and uh, can induce the, the strain. The uh, strain, the strain will affect the uh, selectivity, uh, the production oh. of C two products. So here, it's just uh, I, I don't know uh, what's the thickness for the carbon layer, the uh, graphical okay. carbon okay. shell. So do you think uh, also like that paper, uh, you control the cyclist, control the string, and uh, will affect the selectivity? Thank yeah, you. I, I think so, because the in this way, we didn't do the some thickness study of this carbon shell for the selectivity, but we focus on the some, we try to focus on the some two, this carbon shell should uh, prevent the some reconstruction, and also this should be, very effective for the some like a uh, copper dopant uh, penetration. So we focus on that way, but I totally agree because this is a car carbon shell thickness also can affect some selectivity of the copper because the uh, carbon shell can also affect uh, some CO2 absorption of the copper, I think. So uh, yeah, but in this paper, uh, we couldn't do that kind of study, but uh, I totally agree. Yeah, that would be very effective yeah, for the catalyst design. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, for for solar worker, yeah. <laughs> oh, <that's special. laughs> okay, also yes. sorry. So many questions. It's okay. Uh, it's but very interesting okay. your work. Yeah. So so also many questions. Uh, in third part, you mentioned for for the hydrogen, yeah, hydrogen active hydrogen, is very uh, uh beneficial for improve the selectivity. Uh, as we know, especially in thermal catalysis, uh, also we can get the active hydrogen. Uh, but hydrogen and then we we'll speed over from one phase to another phase, just from one active site and speed over to another active site. Uh, just and then we see, uh, just affect the selectivity. Just like a CO, but you, especially in tender catalysis or cascaded, also we can call cascaded catalysis uh, in CO2R test. Uh, we also mentioned the CO speed over from one phase to another phase. Yes. yes. For example, from, from for for example, from silver to copper, you mentioned for Part of what? So for for hydrogen uh, species, uh, this uh, is the media products. I may, maybe yeah, we can call it. So also we are speed over from one phase to another phase. Do we think just like a CO, uh, we can control the selectivity? Uh, you you mean the uh some like uh spillover effect of the CO? I understood and the some. Do you mention about uh, like uh, hydrogen or yeah, yeah hydrogen just like a third part third part uh, you, you, part three you mentioned the, the AA yeah ascorbic acid will be ah, uh, I see, I see. will decompose to hydrogen uh I see I see the hydrogen is very important uh, to improve That's the right. selectivity yeah for C two products so I just wonder uh for the hydrogen uh, also we are like just like uh, CO uh, in the mm. intermediate mm. products we we'll spill over from one phase to another phase. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Because the <clears throat> yeah, first one, the spillover effect has been also focused by the some COs, right? Because uh, if we apply the some like a uh, silver or the some like a uh, iron porphyry, which can produce a CO two CO, then this will be very effective for the controlling the SNO and SN. That is a part one. And at this part, we yeah, I also agree with the, this kind of thing. Also, can be the some like a spillover uh point of view. So we try to use this kind of some like uh, ascorbic acid to promote the, some proton and the, some electron transfer to enhance the CO2 to this kind of CO 
a conversion because this auditron CO is very important for the CC coupling, is right? So in this way, I think this the kind of the ascorbic acid can be the agent to enhance the proton transfer also. And but I think that if we just focus on some proton transfer, for example, if this CO is protonated by the C, by forming the CHO, and this will goes to the methane or the methanol production, not the CC company. So it means that some there should be the adequate spillover for the some hydrogen in this way. So I think we need to study more about this one. But in this way, because we, if we make some uh, reversible redox cycle of the ascorbic acid, and these all very effective to produce uh, some CO, and this was also observed by the Institute Raman with the, some enhanced the CO coverage in this way. Yeah, but I also agree with the, some spillover. The hydrogen is also very important. Will be important, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, just like you mentioned the CC company, uh, hmm. one question, yeah. especially for, for part one, uh, copper silver, please uh, saturated, uh, separated the uh, uh, copper and silver or superrated super uh, copper and silver uh, yeah. structures. Uh, so for CC company, uh, uh, still, I, I think now is under conversion. Uh, for asymmetric CC company or symmetric car CC company, so in, in your system uh, for the structure, so which one do you support? Or oh, here, which one do you think uh, uh, just uh, uh, is real for, for your uh, for the mechanism, do you think? Oh yeah, because uh, in this way though, what I mentioned the first time is that the, so because the, in general, if we mix the metal with the other elements, and this can be the some phase separated one, or this can be the disorder mixture. It means that the, some uh, elements are dispersed. Uh, uniformly or they can be totally separated. In this way, there can be the limited number of the copper silver or copper rich site. In copper rich site means the interface between copper copper. And copper silver means the interface with the copper silver. And as we know, because of this intermediate dimension is very small. So it is very important to design this kind of inter number of interface between them. So the result of this calculation is start from the we both need a copper copper and a copper silver simultaneously. It means that some if we make this phase separated one, there can be a lot of copper copper, silver silver, but there will be less copper silver interface. But in the case of the uniformly mixed one, there can be a lot of the copper silver interface, but there can be less copper copper. So this would be beneficial for the transition for the SLN and SNO pathway, but this will lower the portion of the CC coupling. So in that way, that is the reason why I mentioned we both need the copper copper and the copper silver simultaneously. So that is the reason why we try to focus the partially mixed copper silver and the, some parts are separated. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your reply. So any other questions for those CNSU? Yeah, you can directly communicate with Dr. Lam. Very good chance, yeah. <laughs> Okay, if no question, uh, the, the, now it's okay. There are still one half hour now for the talk. You know, <laughs> such a long time. And thanks That's for your time. yeah strong support to uh, our smart matter uh, seminars. And thank oh, you for your wonderful awesome. talk and uh, detailed uh, answer to the all questions. Uh, and also welcome to submit your work to smart Mac. Thank you. And oh, yeah, also <laughs> when you're available in future, welcome to visit uh, uh, China Tianjin City. Yeah, Tianjin University. Yeah, okay. Give I give an offline talk in future. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope to visit and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this wonderful seminar today. And uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Yeah, and see you. See thank you. you. Thanks again bye. for your bye. attention. Yeah. Bye. Bye.